Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the third uh, webinar sponsored by the Review of Political Economy. Um, today we have quite a great, uh, quite a good um, lineup of speakers and commentators. The topic today is Do Central Banks Serve the People? It is based on a book of the same title by our guest speaker today, Clément Fontan, who is a professor at the Faculty of Economics, Social and Political Science and Communication at the University at the Université Catholique de Louvain in Belgium. He is the author with François Claveau and Peter Dietsch of this book, which is published at Wiley. We have three great uh, commentators today. The first from the University of Leeds is Malcolm Sawyer. The second from Université de Grenoble Alpes, uh, Guillaume Vallet. And the third, also from the University of Leeds, is Gary Dimsky. Um, thank you once again. Uh, Clément, if you want to share your PowerPoint presentation, uh, please do. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. All right. So uh, thank you, everyone. First, uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's actually quite exciting to speak uh, in front of so many uh, qualified colleagues. And, um, and well, the book starts to be already a bit old. Uh, it was written in 2017 with Francois Claveau and Peter Ditch, and it was actually an offspring from um, a project that was funded by the Canadian uh, Social Science uh, to, to Fund. And uh, the, the project was coordinated by Peter Ditch and it was specifically on the distributive effects of monetary policy. And uh, we tried to tackle that topic from an um, ethical, uh, applied epistemology philosophy perspective. So we really wanted to do something very interdisciplinary at the heart. And, uh, and the book is an outcome uh, of, uh, of that ambition. So uh, my idea is to, is to scroll quickly throughout our argument, but I would spend a bit more time on our last uh, part, which is about uh, our proposition, or at least the debate on possible reforms of monetary policy, because I think that that is the most uh, important point to tackle today. All right, so uh, what do we do in that book? Um, So the outline of the argument is quite simple. So the sole legitimate purpose of central bank as public institution is to serve the public interest. The definition has been shifting as we write in the very first page uh, at, the, at its inception. The goal of the Bank of England was to finance war against France. And hopefully today, as a Frenchman, I can say that uh, these policy goals have, be, have shifted. Um, so what, uh, do central, what does it mean uh, today uh, for central banks to serve the common good, the public good, or as we put it, uh, to serve the people? So um, this question is even more pressing now since, because since 2007, central banks have modified the role they play in the economy and they also have expanded vastly their competencies and their realm of intervention. So in this context, can we be confident that what central banks do and what they are asked to do best serve the people? So we outline three normative worries that also constitute the chapters of our book. So we first focus on the unjust distributional effects of monetary policy at large, not just ECB, the undue weight given to financial interest in the formulation of monetary policy. And finally, we do also have a, a applied epistemology perspective and we try to, to answer whether there is a problematic domination of central banker in the scientific field of uh, their competence. So, it's really not well done, these PowerPoints. Uh, <laughs> okay, we all know uh, that, uh, but uh, we start uh, by remembering uh, the, the, the basic, the 101 of uh, modern central banking, which is the era of central bank uh, independency, which started from a theoretical perspective at the end of the 70s, but the institutional translation was rather 
at the beginning of the 90s. So there was um, a global spread of the CBI template and the template is basically rest on two legs. The first leg is that there is a very high level of independency given to central bank and that level of, of independency is compensated by um, a definition of central bank objective which, are, which is quite narrow. So, we, the temp, so there is always a trade-off between the level given the level of independence given to central bankers and um, the range of their objective and the central bank independence template is uh, in this trade-off is characterized by high level of central bank independence and narrow missions focus on price stability and that was the policy template from the beginning of the 90s to 2007 or today, this is actually uh, still a question uh, that we have to answer. Uh, this was the central banking template um, that was governing uh, before the crisis. So uh, some implication derived from the template. The first one is that there is a benign neglect towards financial stability. Oh, this has been super well covered in the literature, so I will, I will go fast on that. But this also implies that other institutions must take monetary policy as a given and accord it and fix their own macroeconomic policy from that. Um, and the third implication of that template is that there should be a distributive neutrality of monetary policy on the middle and long term. Why? Because according to central bankers themselves, and this is quite actually interesting to explore, there is a strong link between independent dependency from political authority and distributive neutrality of a given policy. Why? Because independent technocrats are not supposed to make distributive choices and to select who are the winners and who are the losers of their policy. They just do not have the political legitimacy to do so. So actually this neutrality derives in two ways. There is the very classic Friedmanian uh, money whale uh, neutrality on the middle and long term, that if you try to boost employment, then uh, financial operators will uh, uh, understand what to do and their uh, expectation will actually make your planes derail. So we all know that. But there is also another conception of mar mar neutrality, which is a bit less well known, but it's also super important, which is market neutrality. What does it mean, market neutrality? It means that central bankers cannot have a distributive impact when they intervene on the market uh, with, uh, with their course of uh, monetary policy. And so interestingly, the main policy tools of central bank before the crisis, so open market operation, they were allegedly more or less market neutral. It was not the kind of intervention that would distort uh, fundamentally prices on the financial market. Um, so that is why central banks were perceived as apolitical because the goal of monetary policy was narrow and consensual and the means to attain it was benign. And that's why also central bank independence templates spread like wildfire during the 1990s. And if you want to actually have a very crystal clear and maybe um, uh, almost comical uh, perspective on that template. So the two pictures on the right of the, of the slide of the PowerPoint actually derived from an ECB pedagogical video that is targeting uh, children from age eight to age 13. And they explain their raison d'etre if you want. And so on the top uh, left hand, you have the inflation monster that is trying to corrupt uh, youngsters in what appears to be 20s Germany and they wake up from that dream where inflation monster would wake the economy because it's their day of visit to the ECB and the technocrat try to reassure them that they can put the inflation into a bottle thanks to their uh, independence which give them credibility on the markets. All right, so we all know that. So what did the crisis change? So first of all, uh, interest rates uh, were all lower, uh, lower than zero, and interest rate policy, did, uh, interest rate became secondary tool in the fixation of monetary policy, and central banks start to play with their balance sheets much more, and they implemented two type of unconventional measures to stabilize the financial system. The first type is asset purchases. The second type 
is the extension of open market operation. So for example, the ECB LTRO and TLTRO measures are very good examples of that. There was also a gain of financial supervision competencies. So in the EU, the ECB became supervisor of the world banking system, but in England also, the Bank of England gained supervisory competencies back. And there has been an extension of political influence in the case of the ECB, where its agents were participating to the so-called expert troika groups and were supervising the reforms that were implemented in uh, financially distressed countries. So what is interesting, um, so a very good proxy to see this change uh, and the evolution of competencies of central bank is to look at the size of their balance sheet actually. So the balance sheet is a, quite a good proxy, why? Because more or less the higher your balance sheet is uh, in relation to the GDP of your economy, the more uh, you play an intermediation role in the economy and more your policies might have distributive, distributive consequences. So, so that's why the evolution of, of balance sheet is quite an important uh, proxy for us to look at because it also influences our normative uh, predicaments. Now, um, these changing roles actually put uh, the CBI template under stress. Why? Because uh, first of all, uh, and according to, to some central bankers themselves, their policy, their unconventional policies have strong distributive implication. And because of this implication, monetary policy has been back on the political radar and central bankers fear for their independence because it's one of the main plank of the central bank independency template that starts to loosen here. So what are they afraid about and what do they fear? So, um, basically, the biggest fear of central bankers today is that it might become more or less clear that uh, their monetary policies are participating to increase wealth and uh, economic inequalities at large. Why? Because basically, uh, if you look at asset purchases, which is the main policy tools of central bankers today, so we decide to isolate asset purchases. You could also try to do the same kind of analysis with, with interest rates, of course, or even LTRO, but here we, we, we zoomed in on uh, asset purchases. And you have two kinds of effects that are competing toward each other. The first one are direct effects, and the second one are indirect effects. Direct effects are, are increasing inequality. Why? Because asset purchases push the prices of financial assets up. And so the people who own financial assets become richer, and these people are usually concentrated at the top end of the wealth distribution. And now the big empirical question is, are these direct, direct effects outweighed by indirect effect, the indirect effect of asset purchases, which tend to boost growth and hence employment and hence have more inequalitarian effect. And there is a big debate today in uh, the empirical literature about whether direct or indirect effects matter the most. And our take on that, or at least today our take on that, we were a bit less mature at the time of writing the book on this kind of issue, is that um, there are reasons to doubt uh, that indirect effects uh, outweigh direct effect. First of all, well, because of the length of that, uh, of the causal effects uh, that are created. So it's very easy to observe uh, the correlation between asset, asset purchases and the evolution of asset prices, but it's much harder to trace back the causal, causal impact of asset purchase way down uh, the end of the causal line and hence employment. There are many more things happening, so we can be much less certain about uh, the, the, the specific causality of that effect. The second, uh, the second reason for us to worry is that uh, one of the big levers of, um, of asset purchases is supposed to be the more ample fiscal room given to governments so that they can expand their social policy and maybe address inequalities. So it's a big part of the justification of central bankers. But today, we 
just do not have enough proof that uh, governments actually use their fiscal room to address the side effects of that monetary policy. So, so it's two clues that lead us to say that a priori, unconventional monetary policy tend to exacerbate inequalities rather than reduce them, even though we don't know enough exactly on that today uh, completely. Now there is, um, so interestingly, so the, the graph you see on the right hand side is actually taken from the study done by ECB researcher and the European Central Bank love to mobilize uh, that research. So it's still a working paper, I think. And, um, and it was actually published front page of the ECB uh, website, I think in July, 2018, and it never happens that the ECB published a working paper, front page of its website, never happens. And it happened with this paper, why? Because this is the sole paper that we have read, which state that the ECB quantitative easing helped to de decrease inequality. So here, the authors state that indirect effect outweighed the direct effect. And what is their indicator, and what is their indicator to check this out? It's that they look at the evolution of median net wealth in the EU since 2015, which was the start of the, quantita of the ECB asset purchase program. And they say that since then, uh, inequalities have started to decrease. So they divided uh, the Eurozone households in five groups, which also is quite new to me. Like, so Usually, you um, studies on inequalities focus on the 10%, 0.1%, 0.001%, .001%, and here we have quite quantiles of median wealth distribution. We don't really know why. Uh, and so they are expressed in percentage, and we decided to use exactly the same data, but in raw numbers. So this is the graph you see on the right side of the screen. And when they are in gross number, well, the perspective on inequality, on equality, inequality change uh, slightly. And we have computed actually that it would take more than 250 years this, at this pace for the, um, the gross number to match uh, each other. So for uh, the lower quintile to have the same um, increase in wealth, so not the total of wealth, but just the increase in wealth, it would take more than 250 years. So well, this, all this kind of consideration are of course not included in the ECB study. And this is also why we are quite frustrated with the way central bankers do their research uh, on the distributive effect of their own monetary policy. Now there is a certain kind of, of uh, um, distributive effect, which is linked to the market neutral um, uh, principle. So today the central, the central bank started to purchase uh, government bonds. So we, we are to, uh, government bonds, sorry, corporate uh, bonds. And in some cases, uh, even uh, shares, so in the case of the Swiss National Bank, uh, uh, the Swiss National Bank actually purchased shares also. So it became much more uh, publicly uh, debated since the Federal Reserve also started to do so. Uh, but uh, the Bank of England started in 2009, the, bank, uh, the European Central Bank started in 2015. So these are quite recent measures. Um, uh, central bankers claim that they are market neutral. Why? Because uh, when they purchase corporate securities, they say they purchase the whole universe of these uh, securities. But, and this is quite true actually, when we look in detail, there is no significant deviation from what the ECB purchase uh, to uh, the actual uh, universe of corporate securities. The only problem is that uh, corporate debt uh, market is not representative of the economy at all. Why? Because there are certain firms which need more external financing and which have more capacities to, to attract external financing than others. And very often, these firms are large multinational firms with a lot of collateral to post to get that kind of loans, which are these firms. Very often, they, these are your big oil company. And one part of the reasons why that they can actually post the oil that has not been extracted as collateral 
to get this kind of loans. So there are, uh, the share of the corporate market is already biased in, uh, in favor of certain companies. And when central bankers replicate the structure of this market in their purchase, they fuel this bias as well. So that is why we cannot say uh, that uh, there is still distributive neutrality uh, with unconventional uh, monetary policy. Now, uh, so this is actually the business sector composition of the corporate sector security purchase program of the ECB. So you can see uh, the fossil fuel like carbon intensive transportation are overrepresented in the ECB purchases. Not overrepresented, not in relation with the market as it stands, but with the economy at large. Uh, now, we have a second worry, which is about um, what we call financial dominance in the book, but dropped that concept because it was not the best uh, in the meantime. But uh, the idea is that um, financial interests are given an undue weight uh, in the formulation of monetary policy. Why? Because actually central banks suffer from what we call a an important structural and infrastructural power of uh, the private financial company, which is related to both their size. They are so big that it's impossible for them, it's impossible for regulators to let them fail. So it's the classic too big to fail, moral hazard issue. So this is all uh, um, a coined under uh, the structural power concept. But more interestingly, and this is more new in the literature, Central bank also suffer from the private sector infrastructural power. So it's related to the fact that uh, private finance still form the channels of transmission of monetary policy. And for central banks to channel their monetary policy to the real economy, they depend on the willingness of the private financial institution to follow their policy signaling. And if private financial institutions do not follow, well, it's becoming harder for the central bank to control the economy. And so here, a classic example is the ECB LTRO. So the ECB gave a large um, uh, liquidity offers to commercial banks so that commercial banks could use that liquidity offer to lend more to the real economy. But what did commercial bank do, did with that uh, liquidity was basically to perform carry trade operation so that they were purchasing uh, government bonds at 3% for 10 for three years and uh, borrowing liquidity from the ECB at 1% for three years as well and they were just pocketing the difference. Or they were also engaging in, um, in um, uh, share buybacks um, or other uh, financial behavior that do not match the ECB policy interest. So the ECB actually tried to regain control by adding a conditionality component to its liquidity offer. So long-term refinancing operation became targeted long-term refinancing operation. But the problem is that because of that conditionality element, commercial banks were much more reluctant to get liquidity from the central bank up to a point where the commercial banks started to lack liquidity, but they still did not want to take the TLTRO with a strong conditionality component. And so here you have a classic who will blink first uh, game. And well, it's central bankers who blink first and they just remove the, the most meaningful part of the conditionality component and uh, commercial banks started to take that liquidity again. So what can we uh, conclude from that example is that um, uh, because of that infrastructural power, central bankers have problems to control how the liquidity they provide uh, to the financial sector are actually used and mobilized in the economy. And this can explain the gap between the magnitude of uh, unconventional monetary policy and their relative, relative limited impact on the real economy. The fact that the prior financial system is still a black box which is situated between central banks and the real economy. And finally, our last worry is the central bank epistemic domination. So uh, what do we mean by that? We mean that 
there are reasons to worry about the fact that central bankers today are becoming the main experts of their main field, uh, of their own field of competences. So the graph you see on the top right hand is the number of publication in top journal of monetary economics, where at least one of the author is a central banker. And you can see that this share moved from 0 0.15 uh, in the middle of the 70s to more than half today. Uh, so with that increasing share, increased share of publication, also comes more editorial responsibility, more reviewing assigned to central banker, and so they can act as gatekeeper uh, on the scientific field, which is pertaining to their own operation. So why do we actually worry about this domination? It is because, um, because researchers working at central banks are also working at a policy-making institution. They do not face the same incentive than we do as academics not working in policymaking institutions. Basically, we have to worry much less about the reputation of our employer that ECB researchers have to. And there is also a much stronger um, uh, procedures and mechanism of control about who writes what within central bank than they are within a uh, traditional uh, research department. So we actually just worry that the very specific position of central banks as both a research center and policy makers give, um, give problematic incentives for researchers which might care more about the reputation of their employer that um, practicing science as really as supposed to do at least in academia. Um, and of course, uh, one of the problem uh, related with that also is that um, uh, central bankers form a very cohesive group um, with quite strong uh, core belief. So for example, for more than 94% of central bankers today, uh, the central bank independence template is still the optimal template uh, for monetary policy. Uh, we, we have analyzed that there have been more than uh, 9,000 working papers that have been published by central banks since 2007, but only five on independency and two on radical alternative options such as helicopter money. So maybe today this has increased actually, but so these stats are from 97 to 2017. So that might have changed a bit. And even if you take the most recent poll today, only 21% of central bankers think climate change is a major risk to financial stability. So there are, there are polls that have been done in 2018, 2019. So we can see that some societal concerns are not represented very adequately in the community of central bankers. And if they can monopolize the own field of, of uh, knowledge, then uh, there is a less uh, probability that they can be influenced by external criticism. Basically. So uh, the graph you see on the top right hand on the screen is quite interesting. So they, those are the inflation projection made by the ECB research staff. So as you can see, uh, so in, in red, the line is uh, HICP as it actually happened. So the real rate of inflation uh, in Europe, in the Euro area. And uh, the other colored line that go upwards are the projection of inflation made by the ECB staff so that you can see that the ECB staff has a tendency to always overestimate inflation. Why? Because basically, uh, who is producing uh, these charts? It's um, the ECB DG economics, where you have more than a majority of German researchers, and we know that they are suffering from strong inflation worries, and so that might be an explanation why, uh, why apparently they have a model that is systematically false and usually in economics when you have models that generate the same kind of bias you try to address them but it looks like it's not so much the case with the ECB. So again some worries about the fact that we have to trust ECB researcher both as researcher and ECB agents. So finally what are also yeah okay so this is a personal uh, memoir souvenir so so it's a presentation I've done with um, it's a workshop I've done with some uh, people from the ECB 
And I love that title of one of the slides. So it's the ECB is accountable for fulfilling the mandate that was democratically assigned to it. So that you can see that the research results of ECB people on their own accountability do not show so much nuance. Now, um, our conclusions. So in our last chapter, we say that faced with all that um, issues uh, or problematic dimension of the central bank independence template, we should think about, about some reforms. So we try to divide reforms in two camps. The first camp is moderate reforms. So those reforms were the reforms we felt at ease to endorse, to say like, okay, we can do that now. We feel quite confident with this. And you have more radical reforms where we do not have an opinion, but we consider that more research should be done on that issues. So moderate reforms, um, I would actually change that. Uh, I do not think that <laughs> a central bank should do green asset purchase, but rather that they should implement a broad list, uh, both on their collateral framework and for their asset purchase. But they should not do that alone. That broad list should be, that broad list should be designed by Parliament. So we ask for better uh, comments of the distributive effects of monetary policy, and we think that the good solution for that is to give central bankers more um, democratic legitimacy. For example, by increasing coordination mechanism with parliamentary body, so that they do not force they do not feel forced to replicate market neutrality, um, market structure in their monetary policy operation. So the idea is to shelter central bankers with more democratic oversight so that they have the legitimacy to reorient their monetary policy uh, towards a certain class of financial assets. Um, more financial regulation also. So we think that one of the big issue uh, which uh, central bankers are confronted today is their lack of control over, um, over the, the transmission of monetary policy. And this lack of control also comes from the radical changes uh, in the structure of financial market, which happened since basically the start of the financialization process uh, at the end of the, of the 1980s. And so we claim that we should just implement more financial regulation, but with structural reforms, separating investment bank from retail bank, uh, financial transaction tax, and also more diversity within central bank boards so that to address the epistemological concerns of a varied source uh, of criticism. Finally, we, uh, we, we also presented some more radical reforms such as helicopter money, 100% reserve banking, digital, uh, central bank digital currency, and uh, also maybe a setup of external research committee that would be financed by central banks, but on which central bankers would not have their direct control. So that to address the, the, the issue of biases and so forth and so on. Just one word on uh, helicopter, helicopter money. Um, so today, uh, there, there, there is a lot of, of debates on that topic, and there have been more and more calls uh, by, by heterodox economists for central banks to implement uh, monetary, uh, monetary um, sorry, helicopter money or monetary drops, whatever you call it. According to us, one of the big, big flaws of this thinking today is that the, the democratic legitimacy aspect is not taken into account at all. So to, to, to perform a helicopter money, you have to do strong political choice. Who are the recipients? Are, are those the citizens or the residents of a given country? Should we modulate the amount distributed according to uh, the initial uh, position of a given household on the income distribution ladder? Uh, should we give more money to households with more children and so forth and so on. So these are at the root political decision that central bankers cannot take. So this would lead, this would, for helicopter money to happen, you would need much more coordination with fiscal and political authority. And I'll take it that if you already arrive to a point where you have a stronger coordination with fiscal and political authority, then why not move to credit policy, like the same thing we're doing in the 50s, so that 
the government decide the strategic reforms to uh, the strategic sectors to fund and uh, central bank liquidity should prioritize these sectors. So for example, today this is done by the Bank of Japan, but also by the Bank of South Korea. So both of these central banks are actually targeting specific sectors and giving better conditions for uh, liquidity offers when the economic activity is linked to these sectors. The Banque de France was doing that also in the 50s. So I, I think that if you want to move beyond the central bank independence template, one way to think about it would be to think about a better coordination between fiscal and monetary policy, which would allow us to target the kind of reforms we really want, rather than giving blank, rather than technocrats giving blank shit with a lot of legitimacy issue and with less control also on the conception of goods. So, so this was our, our, our take on, on, uh, on helicopter money. Or at least my take, I would not, <laughs> I would not actually include my co-author on that because we didn't talk so much about it. All right, I've been already very long, so I, I, I would stop here. And I'm really e eager to, to, to get your question. Thank you, uh, Clema. Uh, if you can take your slides down, please. Yes, I will. Um, I'm sure. going to go to the commentators. I did want to say um, a few things myself, uh, but I'm not going to, I'm just going to take a few minutes because I'd rather have our, our guest commentators speak. But you mentioned uh, there have been uh, suggestions in the heterodox community about helicopter money. You know, I would be um, careful with that statement. Um, I think there have been a very few people in the heterodox community recommending helicopter money. I would argue that overall, um, the heterodox community probably does not support helicopter money. My own criticism is that really what is happening is um Kima, we we see your table we see your your computer top um i'm sorry i'm trying to take that off <laughs> <laughs> but i'm very interested by the document there called um no uh yeah so i my own criticism is that helicopter money really is fiscal policy and why not let the government then do fiscal policy. And I think that um, the reason is, especially in Europe, because I think the few heterodox who are making that argument comes from Europe, and I think it's a way for them to circumvent uh, the Maastricht Treaty uh, 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 constraints. And that's why, you know, come the recovery time, Europe is going to impose uh, stability in their budgets and they're going to have to try to rebalance their budget somehow. But if we get the central bank to do it, that argument disappears. So I think that's the reason you have the heterodox community, a few uh, in Europe um, have that argument. And as uh, with respect to 100% reserve banking, I'm gonna let maybe Malcolm say a few words on that because I know he's written a paper on that in the Cambridge Journal, uh, harsh criticism of it. Um, but uh, regardless, uh, I did very much enjoy your presentation, and I'm in agreement with a lot of what you said, and, a and I think that a lot of people on here are in agreement uh, with a lot of what you said, and I think that's why we, some of us will focus on the policy recommendations. Okay, so we're going to go to Malcolm um, for his... Uh, uh, is it better with my screen? Uh, have I stopped yeah, to perfect. share my screen? It's perfect. <laughs> We've, I Thanks replaced the so screen with a picture of my face. So I'm not <laughs> better, but whatever. It is what it is. Okay, so if you can um, mute yourself, Clément, and Malcolm, um, the floor is yours, or the screen is yours. Thanks.
Hopefully you've got my screen up in front of you. I will... We do. Yeah, okay, thanks very much. Uh, uh, could I just pick up the, the, the last comment you made about uh, the 100% reserve banking? Indeed, I, just every one time on myself had a paper not amongst a number of other in the Cambridge Journal, I think in 2016. I think in this context, one of the major arguments we, we would have put is that you may introduce 100% reserve banking today and tomorrow the banks will have in, invented some other um, accounts which fall outside of that uh, limitation and then you will de have developing uh, you know, PayPal or shadow banking may move into uh, being able to operate as um, uh, in terms of transferring accounts between each other. So I think within a, within a week, the thing would collapse, but uh, or at least be circumvented. But I, I can go back into that if, 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 if people are interested in it. Um, just to say, uh, the remarks I'm going to make are very much in the UK context. I think the issues which get thrown up in, in terms of the, particularly the ECB, are uh, much more complex and uh, in terms of obviously the relationship between the national governments and the central bank or the EU and, and, and the ECB and so forth. I want just to make comments on, I think, four sort of issues, uh, picking up quite a bit that's been said about central bank independence and then some other comments about quantitative easing and indeed helicopter money as well, central banks and inequality and then central banks and the climate emergency. Uh, I, I think we should now strongly argue against um, the independence of the central bank and really seriously move towards removing that. Um, again, that will be obviously extraordinarily difficult in the, in the European context, but in the, in the UK context, it really just means reverting back to the situation we had uh, probably pre-92 or pre-97. Um, and there are, I think, a, a whole a set of different issues about why I would argue for removing uh, central bank independence. I think the first is a, is a way was relates back to the initial concerns that many of us had over central bank independence. And I'm kind of proud to say that I gave a paper in Toronto in 1994 arguing against the uh, independence of central banks. And that argument was there very much on the basis of the type of framework within which this central bank independence was to operate that this sort of what became known as inflation targeting and that was on the basis that for example we didn't on the whole don't accept the Phillips curve we don't accept the idea of conservative central banks bankers who put much more emphasis on raising unemployment than they do are uh, sorry yeah much less concerned about unemployment than, than inflation and also whether indeed a central bank could it could establish a so-called credibility it seems to me that um, they've often failed to uh, meet their inflation targets and in that sense I'm not, I'm not sure how, how you know, credible they remain I think one could also pick up the point which I think the speaker made um, that this was all at most was political independence and not ideological independence. They were very much locked into a sort of just what you might call it sort of neoliberal concept of, of, of the way that uh, monetary policy should be operated. Uh, and also the extent to which they were really um, certain would be served in the interests of the financial sector rather than, than uh, the, the rest of us. So I, I would argue that there was a faulty model of inflation which underlied the central bank independence. But now uh, more, um, we realise that inflation targeting uh, and concern over price stability may well have run counter to concerns over financial stability. And we see, at least in the UK, I think somewhere else, the, the, the concerns of the, or the, the objectives of the central bank have now shifted also to include things like financial stability. But I, I want to, read to, to, to argue that um, there, there should be um, a reformulation of the objectives of central banks to move well beyond inflation targeting and to include 
support of government policies in general. Now, uh, that I suppose one could say is already in the sort of um, uh, mandate of the of the of the ECB, but I think it should be kind of spelt out. That is that the central bank should always support the fiscal policies of the of the government, and so when the government wishes to spend, the central bank is obligated to provide the necessary finance that it should act in ways which are at least consistent with, for example, addressing the climate emergency, or, and also taking into account some of the issues which were raised in the presentation, concerns over inequality. So I would argue for spelling out the ways in which the central bank should be supporting, should be uh, supporting government policy, and that the objectives of the central bank must be laid down by democratic decisions and any, decision, any decisions of, of spending, for example, uh, should be uh, under some form of democratic control insofar as we have democracy. Um, so I would argue for uh, sort of establishing a relationship between government and central bank, which I would say is akin to what the relationship, at least in the UK, used to be between the government and the nationalised industry when we had electricity uh, and, and uh, public ownership, for example, or, or um, gas and so forth, the electricity board was um, uh, there to, as it were, generate, generate and distribute electricity in an, in an efficient manner. But many decisions which were made by the uh, electricity boards would be subject to government approval. So government would have a say over, for example, the prices to be charged or the investment policies of, of, of the electricity board. And I think that should be that sort of relationship between now the, the central, uh, the government and the central bank. I would also, as an aside, um, reflecting back, um, I think again, the point was raised, which was who should be, um, as we're running or, or directing the, the central bank. Again, I'm not sure what the situation in other countries was, but in, in the UK until, I'm not sure, probably sometime in the 1980s, the board of directors of the Bank of England would include representatives of, of, of trade unions, for example, with representatives of, of, um, of business. And then we've had a shift under um, the independence of the, of, of the Bank of England to uh, a group of a combination of uh, bankers and economists making the decisions over, over monetary policy. So again, shifting back to who um, is making some of the key decisions in, in the central bank. But also I think it's, um, and I'm not sure whether here is, is how far we can go with this, but also trying to establish what areas the central bank is able to have some influence over uh, and, and where it does not. And I think quite often, uh, and not not in 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 the the presentation, but elsewhere, somehow people are almost suggesting, well, the the central bank could do this, could do that, and quite often making proposals which do not uh, the fall within the remit of the central bank, but in which they really have very much, I don't couldn't have very much influence. So I decided to put up this quote um, about dangers of assigning monetary policy to a larger role than it can perform, and so forth. And this is a quote taken from Milton Friedman's uh, AER paper in 1968. And I'm sure um, the roles which he would have assigned and <laughs> which I would have assigned to the central bank are rather different. But I think there is that issue that um, uh, monetary policy and the, bank and, and the role of the, of the central banks is, is often given a great deal more importance than, or, or given, seem viewed to be more effective or have more impact than, than is the case. And as an aside, I might say, I, I think that, that may be the case in terms of inflation targeting. I, uh, Philip Arrestus and myself have, have argued in a number of places that the ability of the central bank to actually control inflation is, is very limited. I just want to make some, some uh, relatively quick remarks, um, uh, firstly under a, a quantitative easing. As, as was mentioned in the presentation, uh, 
uh, about helicopter money, but others have proposed various forms of quantitative easing or people's quantitative easing or green quantitative easing, uh, QE for, for universal basic income and so forth. And I think the issues which were in a sense mentioned um, also by Louis Philippe very much apply here, that decisions on spending and I think people's QE, green QE, these are all proposals for spending. Those should be taken by the democratic government and not by the in independent central bank. But I also think we should point out that the, the central bank doesn't have a helicopter and it doesn't have anybody to drive the helicopter. That is, the central bank does not have the administrative machinery to um, implement any of these. Nor would I want it, for example, the central bank to be deciding if there was some sort of green quantitative easing, the central bank to be actually deciding who is going to receive the funding. I don't think it has the capability of doing so, and that should be in the hands of some form of um, a green development bank or, 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 or sufficiently. The final point I might just make about the quantitative easing is that Quantitative easing is clearly undertaken at very particular times in order to provide liquidity or um, bolster asset prices or whatever it might be. I don't think there's any reason to think that what is a, the appropriate scale of quantitative easing would match up with the scale of, of the requirements in terms of green investment or basic income or whatever it might be. So the two, I think, should be should uh, be uh, kept as within that sense uh, completely separate. Um, I would want to make, in a way, some perhaps similar remarks in, in, in respect of um, central bank and inequality. Um, in the presentation uh, obviously focused on the effects of quantitative easing on. Um, uh, the distribution of wealth and raise the issue of, of, of what effect it, it has had. Um, I, I think it, if we're going to uh, wish, think that the central bank should pay attention to inequality or pay attention to the effects which its policies have on inequality, then it, uh, it, it's something which should be, should be specified, you know, what dimensions of inequality are particularly relevant what should be uh, should the uh, central bank if it's going to pay any attention to issues of, of income and wealth distribution inequality what are the dimensions which it should be regarding and then i think uh, there's one other point i raise is since i think as was sort of indicated there's sort of firstly disputes over what effect something, <clears throat> something like quantitative easing would have on inequality. <clears throat> but insofar as it does have some effect, would it not be rather better that that issue be a, a, a addressed through taxation? So if there are capital gains or increases in wealth, that that is taxed appropriately, rather than trying to, <clears throat> in a way, guess what the effects of, of the uh, of a particular policy is going to be on uh, on inequality. I would raise one other issue here in terms of uh, income distribution, because in the past, when economists, uh, head to talk to economists, particularly have, have uh, discussed the effect of um, monetary policy on income distribution, the concern has been over the. Um, effect of uh, interest rates on distribution between lenders and savers, uh, and le lenders and borrowers and so forth. I, I think in many respects, we should go back to those concerns and ask the question, what is the, uh, what would be the appropriate aim so far as the central bank is concerned over the setting of interest rates? But clearly at the moment, it's some sort of, well, <laughs> had been in the past been some sort of notion of, well, we go along with Taylor's rule or something like that, so adjust in, in, in line with, with inflation and, and, and so forth. Um, I think we should pay, that within that, we, we don't usually ask much about 
what should be the underlying rate of interest with respect to which you vary it in, in line with inf uh, in response to inflation and so forth. Um, yeah, of course, in the um, mainstream view, that would be around about some kind of natural rate of interest, so-called. <clears throat> I would think it, it in terms of what should be the almost target rate of interest, which maybe approximates to what in other literatures would be called the fair rate of interest. That is, how far should that be aligned up with the, the rate of growth? <clears throat> and I think there's also some implications of that in, in, in terms of uh, issues like climate change and also moving to a, a much lower, if we're going to move to a, a lower rate of, of economic growth, or we may be already there with, with secular stagnation, if we're going to move to a lower <clears throat> rate of growth for environmental reasons or for other reasons, I think we have to adjust or seek to adjust the <clears throat> uh, rate of interest uh, to take account of that um, uh, lower rate of growth. And let me just make some very perhaps rather similar remarks in terms of climate change. Um, Partly, as I've, as I've indicated, I don't think um, the um, <clears throat> central bank should be in any sense um, providing on its, own, on, its, by, on its own accord funds for or finance for green investment or anything like that. It should be supporting the policies which the a government wishes to pursue otherwise. I think also, though, uh, and I think this was touched on in, again in the, in the presentation, the degree to which the any financial assets which the um, central bank acquires through quantitative easing or similar should be consistent with the um, addressing the climate emergency. So the sort of assets which uh, I think were put up on the screen that the central banks are presently acquiring should be stopped, as it were. That is, the, you know, any purchase of financial assets of um, oil companies or, or similar should not be uh, on, on the agenda. So the assets which the central bank is engaged with should be certainly informed by uh, climate ch change considerations. And insofar as the um, central bank is uh, kind of instructed to um, only support what might be termed green investment, that is only to buy financial assets in, in those companies which are in some sense pursuing environmentally friendly uh, policies, it should be again in the hands of the government to decide to determine what is going to be regarded as green investment and that should be as we're consistent with their overall um, environmental policies. It shouldn't be left to the central bank to determine these things. It is a matter for democratic input. Um, so just to uh, suppose summarize, I'm very much wanting to argue in favor of removing the independence of the central bank and for its policies to uh, be pursued in a way which are consistent with the broader objectives of government, even when the, <laughs> uh, even those, whether the objectives may not be those which uh, I personally would approve of, but that the objectives which are, are pursued should be democratically decided upon. And I would not want things like um, uh, quantitative uh, or uh, support of particular forms of expenditure to be delegated to the central bank to decide what it's going to um, put its money into uh, this month. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Malcolm. <clears throat> if you could uh, take your presentation down. Yeah. I'm going to ask uh, Clément to maybe reply to some of uh, Malcolm's comments, which I think uh, aligned with me in a way that of many of these policy recommendations you make should be the uh, purview of governments, not of central banks, I think, if I understand. Malcolm's comments uh, correctly. Um, so if you could take maybe just a few minutes to respond to these. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you, thank you very much uh, for for your comments. Uh, they're, they're actually quite in line with 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 what I think. Also, May, maybe on one thing, which is, we should not be so naive neither about the actual capacity of governments today to act on certain kind of policy. Let me take an example. So. Um, the, the distributive effect of quantitative easing. Let's say that we are convinced today that uh, quantitative easing increases inequality because it increases the wealth of asset owners. Let's, let's say that this is a given. Okay, this is a given, but for a lot of our, our other reasons, uh, we want central bank to, uh, to purchase government bonds because it, it helps uh, governments uh, to pursue the social program and so forth and so on. In this case though, the increase in wealth is concentrated on something that governments are very bad at dealing with today, which is some household becoming rich thanks to the ownership of financial assets, which are very often, you know, uh, traveling through different tax havens and so forth and so on, and even with international regulatory competition, it's quite unsure that tax haven not, not existing, uh, we, we would still have Netherlands or, or, or Switzerland or, or Belgium and so forth and so on. So, so, so I'm wondering to what extent today governments are still able to offset the distributive effect of, uh, of central bank asset purchase because this, uh, the, the, the factor of inequality happens on a segment that today governments have lost control on. So, so this is why we, we try to have a more nuanced view on, on, on the respective role of governments and central bank and our idea that central banks have the duty not to exacerbate inequalities first, whatever, whatever it is. We, we do not go as far as saying that central bank has a, have the duty to actively target and pursue um, inequality diminution objective because we do not think that this should be this is a valid objective in all times and there are a lot of legitimacy issues but what we say is that central bank try all they can not to exacerbate inequality in the first place because governments cannot off offset that after so so this is our take on 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 the, the the boundaries of responsibility between central banks and government here like one of the solution we try to offer in the book is that when there is a sudden massive variation in the volume of, of, of central bank balance sheets so that when central banks start to engage in a massive asset purchase program, then this is our tipping point saying that from that moment on, central banks should do all that they can not to exacerbate inequalities because they would be too massive for the government to correct them after because of the actual situation of international tax competition that we cannot you know, erase from our mental map uh, today. So, and the second point about the, the, the green asset purchase, it's quite interesting because, again, there are, there are mixed solutions that are quite interesting here. I, I do agree completely with you that central banks should not decide what asset is green or not, and they should not follow ESG norms neither because, well, we know about them that not super great and you should not rely on them so much. But take, for example, uh, the project of taxonomy in the EU. So the, uh, the European Commission started a vast uh, regulatory initiative in which uh, you would have a group of experts which will update on a regular, on a regular basis uh, a taxonomy for green financial assets. So this would be decided by other public authorities than governments or the central bank. And still we could imagine that then the central bank would follow that taxonomy to remove brown assets uh, from its asset purchase, but also maybe to modify its collateral framework to give an incentive or, or, or a financing condition uh, for the green asset rather than the brown one. And in this case, the selection between brown and green asset would be done not by the central bank, neither by the government, but by a kind of, of another form of agency that, 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 that would be created for that purpose. Thank you. So, yes. Okay, thank you. Before we go to our next <clears throat> commentator, I do have a quick uh, comment. At the beginning, you didn't, and it ties into what you just said, 
At the beginning, you talked about the direct and indirect channels of monetary uh, policy transmission mechanism with respect to income distribution. Um, and in the direct uh, channel, you mentioned mainly uh, asset prices. But one thing that you forgot to mention is to talk about is that the rate of interest itself is an income distributive variable yeah. uh, and an income stream for bondholders. And in the end of the day, you have to you have to determine what that interest rate should be. Um, and I've written a, a bunch of papers with Mark Setterfield on these post Keynesian rules. Um, but that's something that should be included in the, in the discussion um, over income distribution and monetary policy. Um, before we go, I just have a quick question from Malcolm. It's a, a question from uh, one of the viewers who says, why are you in favor of the government determining what should be regarded as green instead of the private sector? Well, I, I'm looking at the, the government having a, 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 an overall policy addressing climate, the climate emergency and, and uh, destruction of biodiversity and so forth. And within that context, the government itself has to determine which areas it's going to favor and which it's not. Is it going to favor solar energy over nuclear energy or whatever it might be? So they have to make decisions in the implementation of, of, of government policy. And then and insofar as they want to influence the way that funds are allocated, they have to um, ha have some way of, of setting that sort of agenda. Now, in one sense, the private sector can, if it wishes, determine what is green. I, I can, you know, if, what I spend my money on, I can to some extent determine whether I'm going to spend it on what I regard as green or not. So that doesn't change that. But insofar as the government is having a policy um, for, as I say, addressing climate change, it has to determine what it regards as those sectors which are going to be favoured in whatever way, whether by uh, aiding investment there, in terms of the development of solar energy or whatever it might be, where it's going to provide funds. And so it has to draw that up. And the point I was wanting to make was that um, those decisions, uh, so far as the public sector are concerned, should be made by the government and not by the central bank. As I say, clearly uh, any private individual can decide whether they want to uh, uh, regard one investment as green or not and, and, and follow their conscience accordingly. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now we're going to go to our second commentator, uh, Guillaume Vallet. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Clément, for uh, your uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I think it's a really uh, interesting and timely topic, and you know that I uh, really appreciate uh, your work, so I was uh, very happy to, to hear you today and to listen to you today. Uh, I, I agree with you. That there is a, a complex uh, relationship between uh, central banks and people. Um, from a theoretical perspective, uh, some uh, authors, especially from uh, orthodox authors, say that uh, it's a kind of principal agent uh, relationship. Uh, central banks are uh, supposed to serve the, the people and people are supposed to place uh, confidence uh, in them. So it's a kind of a perfect uh, world. Uh, but uh, central banks are uh, political institutions and thus we know that uh, neither monetary policies nor central banks are uh, neutral. Um, an important thing uh, you mentioned is that uh, central banks uh, cannot be the only game in town. Uh, we need a relationship with the government and um, however with the recent uh, crisis um, we have given a lot of power to these uh, institutions uh, according to different uh, surveys, people do not really know how ex exactly what central banks do and how they uh, really function, but people uh, expect a lot from them. Uh, for instance, the outcome of a recent uh, surveys in uh, Switzerland uh, or a recent referenda in uh, Switzerland exemplify uh, such a uh, statement. 
this is why I agree with you. I think we, we should consider central banks are um, as institutions exerting structural power over the economies and societies. They are able to shape the economy and uh, more uh, importantly, uh, they are able to um, design what we think about the uh, economy and how the economy works. Uh, for instance, you, you mentioned the, the case of uh, inflation, how inflation is uh, represented uh, through um, draws and the pictures and so on. I think it's really important to have this uh, in, uh, in mind. And maybe uh, such a power is likely to increase in the future uh, if central banks uh, will be given a multi-goal mandate and if um, more economic actors, banks or countries uh, get indebted uh, to uh, central uh, banks. So I think th the important issue is also to think about ways uh, to uh, balance central banks' uh, structural uh, power. And regarding this, I have a series of uh, three questions. Some of them maybe have already be, uh, been asked by uh, Malcolm, but I'm going to, to remind um, some of them. The first one is, um, what do you think about the um, issue of independence of central banks? Uh, has independence uh, become a misnomer regarding the nature of the recent crisis and uh, the nature of uh, recent central banks' uh, policies? Um, if so, in your view, what should be the relationship between central banks and government in the future? Um, my second question is the following. Um, can you say more uh, words on your proposal at the end in your last uh, slide to increase uh, diversity on the central bank's uh, boards? Um, as far as I am concerned, and to some extent it was the topic of uh, the, the latest uh, seminar last week, I believe that real and lasting change can in central banks can only happen um, happened if the whole internal organization of these institutions change. Um, command and control measures, uh, such as uh, creating, uh, uh, imposing new, new diversity, for instance, could be counterproductive, and we should turn to voluntary measures uh, in order to um, start behaving in a more inclusive way for everybody in the uh, So I think at stake uh, is changing the whole culture of central bankers and uh, central banking at large. So do you think, uh, is it enough to increase diversity just uh, in the board, or uh, should we uh, rethink the whole uh, uh, internal organization of central bank? Uh, and I believe in, uh, in this, personally. Uh, my third uh, remark is that the word uh, confidence maybe is lacking in your presentation. Uh, in many countries, there are uh, many uh, initiatives coming from central banks aiming to increase confidence people place in, in them. Uh, of course, we, we think about, uh, the, uh, about the communication policies, but we can see now also a new museums opening uh, in order to present uh, how the central bank uh, functions uh, and how it works, uh, what uh, are uh, it's their um, purpose, and so on. So this is maybe a new channel in order to improve uh, confidence uh, at large. You said uh, in uh, your slide number nine that I quote the, the ECB is accountable for fulfilling the mandate that was democratically assigned to, uh, to it. So, in my view, at stake uh, is also um, elites' power and authority. Power and authority converge on the condition authority is viewed uh, as a legitimate power. And um, my question is. Do elites serve the people and how to improve elites' uh, legitimacy? I think it is a wider problem than, uh, than mere uh, central banks' legitimacy as institutions uh, in democracy. Uh, because I think that there is a kind of crisis or maybe people don't trust their elites anymore. And they also want to be more involved in the decision-making process. We have seen this, for instance, in France with the Yellow Vest, uh, Gilets Jaunes uh, movement, for, uh, for instance. So in, slide number, in your slide number 10, you mentioned external research committee. Can you say more words uh, on them? Um, because uh, I, 
I'm not sure it will be it will be uh, enough uh, just to create external uh, and especially research committee in order to improve confidence people place uh, in these institutions. Because yeah. at stake is also uh, the question uh, how to improve the control society exerts over uh, central banks. Uh, do we also need internal and not external bodies uh, with uh, people coming from uh, the civil society, for instance? In, in a recent survey we have um, conducted with uh, Louis Philippe um, on, uh, on three central banks, um, people uh, working in central banks largely agreed with the propo proposal according to which we need um, more representatives coming from civil society. In their view, it was people coming from business, not society. So what do you think about that? Uh, do you think uh, it, is, it could be also helpful, useful, to create new internal bodies uh, with uh, new people coming from society uh, inside? So thank you very much uh, once again, Clément, for your presentation. It was uh, insightful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, point out that Guillaume has a PhD in economics and another one in sociology, but not in mathematics. I think there were more than three questions in his <laughs> comments. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Guillaume. Uh, it, it was uh, very good uh, to, to, to listen to, to your feedback and, uh, and you have a super interesting question, which remind me more of my political sciences seminar than political economy seminar, so it's great. It's, it's back to the roots for me. And plus, we, we come from the same uh, Grenoble place uh, where I got my PhD as well. So it's really going back to the roots. Now I would frustrate you because I can't transfer to everything. Just uh, maybe two, uh, three. So, so I will, I will um, consider that you have asked three questions. Uh, so on, on the first question, which is about the tenants of central bank, to me, we really should distinguish two things. The first one is a very classic democratic principle of separations of power that you have between different entities. And this, I think, we should keep. So to, to keep central banks independent in a way as courts of justice are. But the other dimension of independence, which uh, stems from the time consistency argument or the, 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 Luc the Lucas critique at large, this one we should remove it. So, so the, the, the principle of independence that it is there to gain the confidence of market operators so that they do not anticipate future rounds of inflation. Well, I think this uh, dimension of independence has been proven maybe not wrong, but has been proven problematic on many other aspects, including financial stability. And I think it, this theoretically informed a perspective on central bank independence that we should try to get rid of. So, for example, uh, mixed committees are, are quite an interesting way to think about, or, um, like, like, for example, uh, the, the way the Bank of England was doing before 1997, uh, actually. So there were coordination with the Treasury, and the, the governors to decide what was the appropriate interest rate and objective for central banks to achieve. But in a similar way, you, you can also find even when, govern, when central banks were much more linked with the development of, developmental state after World War II. So uh, on an institutional perspective, their level of independence was much lower than today, but they still they, 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 they were still having some autonomy because they were having the technical expertise and so forth and so on. So I think that we should come back on more mixed um, uh, perspective of independence, but we should keep a part of, of autonomy for central bankers because they can play this role of counter power. And so for example, one of the, uh, the question I always ask my students is, how would you react if your central banker would finance what you hate most in this world? So, 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 so that, from that perspective, I think we should keep the principle of a certain degree of independence, but to try to balance it with more coordination with fiscal, with fiscal authority to better control the provision of liquidity. And this brings me to my second point. And, and, and I have not said enough about it, I think. About this coordination, we, we also have to think about the condition in which sovereign debt is emitted today, because this is also something that 
that, that have an influence on how autonomous governments can define their policy prefer preferences. And today, one of the big problems is that public debt is automatically emitted directly on the financial market and we purchase after by central bankers and we should rather um, try to think about a new way of organizing the security, secretary of public money at large, uh, meaning that we should think at the same time about a way to decrease infrastructural power of financial market over central bank monetary policy, and at the same time, trying to decrease <laughs> the structural and infrastructural power of financial markets over uh, the, the determination of public policy and budgetary policy. And to do so, like again, I come back to the 50s uh, very often. Interesting time because uh, there was a high degree of coordination between monetary and fiscal policy at that time. And at that time, the, the sovereign debt were not emitted uh, on financial market. There, were, there was an internal circuit of debt in many countries in Europe, France and Italy, for example, and central bankers were intervening within that internal circuit in which there were not financial operators. So maybe this kind of coordination is something that we want to think about today. And uh, for my part, what I'm doing today is I'm opening the book of Eric Monet, who is an historian of central bank policy during the 50s. And you can find a lot of, you find uh, tons of examples of independent banks join a certain degree of autonomy, but still participating to the developmental role of the state. And I think this is the template that we should go uh, towards today. Finally, uh, about confidence, and this is also a limit of my own argument. It's funny because um, we consider, and I think it's true that central bankers have structural power over the economy, but what was the price? for that structural power and for the confidence of financial market operators. Well, the price to be paid was basically the CBI template and the reorientation of central bank objective towards a price stability objective. And this is one big dead angle of all the critical literature, and I include myself in it. And the, the, the dead angle is that if central banks start to be a bit more like what, they, what we want them to be, so a bit more progressive, a bit more friendly towards green, a bit less friendly towards financial interest, would we would we keep uh, the, the financial market confidence? Wouldn't central banks start to lose a certain degree of structural power of a financial market structure if they would start to follow policy objective that would be slightly uh, more variated than pure inflation targeting regimes? And if when they face trade-off between price stability and let's say environment, if they start to choose environment, wouldn't financial operators start to develop other techniques or other circuitry that does not involve central bank money? And would that mean that we start to lose control over that? It's the most classic dilemma of the regulator, which actually Malcolm uh, started uh, his talk with. And I think that, that way too often it's absent from our map of thinking and including mine and so i think that this is something we should really think more about and uh, about internal bodies yes uh, uh, absolutely diversity of the staff absolutely museum i think that it's a bit less important because who goes to museum maybe not uh, the public at large especially central bank museum is quite a specific public uh, I, I would say but but maybe uh, I think we should have more simple debates and more basic ones, but for example, transfer to accounting bounded bodies. So for example, in Europe, we have uh, the European Courts of Auditors, which have been auditing the ECB many times, and they have claimed and underlined that the ECB was non compliant to provide basic documentation for the audit courts to, to, you know, to do its job, to do their job. So, so, so I would say that the, the first step would be actually to, to to, to fulfill basic duties that central bankers do not feel anymore today. And, uh, and I would also really rethink uh, the central bank's minutes are published and the voting of individual members and so forth and so on. So, so I do not think that it's credible to involve the public at large in the control of, of, of uh, central banking, as long as there is not a better education on money, central bank uh, at school. Uh, it's it just that the basic knowledge of, of central banks are, are not commended enough.
for the public to play a, a large role today. And I, I actually control that every year with my students. They have a lot of facilities to understand, uh, easiness to understand monetary, uh, fiscal policy, tax, and so forth and so on. When we tackle the, the, the topic of money and central bank monetary policy, there is nobody anymore. So, so, so I think the, our first effort would be to really revamp our education, <laughs> uh, our basic education on money and central banking before you know, developing so much this link with wider public. Thank you very much. Uh, we have now come to the last comment uh, of uh, this webinar by Gary Dimsky. And by the way, Gary, I love the painting in your background. Oh, yes. I appreciate I appreciate that. That was for you. Okay. Um, that's <laughs> that was. I wish I had that talent. Um, let me ask you, Louis Philippe. Uh, first of all, am I? Can you hear me? And do you see the screen? We, yes, on both counts. Oh, and I, I have a, maybe eight minutes of, prep, of, of talk. Is that all right? That's fine. Eight minutes is on you. Okay. So I'm going to, first of all, let me say that I love Clement's book. I, 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 the, you and your co-authors have done a, a, a great job. And I would actually um, encourage you, if you have the, the, uh, the will, to perhaps update that book in light of some of the uh, contemporary debates that are going on, because I think uh, it's, it's, it's even handed and opened and raises some you know, questions that I think lots could participate in. So I have uh, basically, let me, let me uh, go through and let's do it this way. Hold on a second. Okay. And let me, yeah, that's good. All right. So I've got four questions I'm going to raise. Um, and uh, just, just to provoke. And these are, these fit in very nicely with uh, what Guillaume said. And so we'll go from there. And let me just make sure. Oops. Uh, let me go. Sorry for that. Okay, now we're in control. There we go. Point number one, um, a really interesting aspect of the conversation by Malcolm in the book and by Guillaume is the government versus the central bank. Um, and you know, then of course we have the provocation of the people. And what we see with uh, Guillaume is, uh, excuse me, with uh, Clement is the, the book uh, is, uh, talks about the idea of, uh, well, you know, actually the, they're not so serious about the uh, monetary rules. Actually, we have more of a Kenneth Rogoff style uh, let's not be too precise, uh, and, and let's indeed perhaps, you know, look for a benevolent type uh, action by a, a Rogoff type. In fact, couldn't we just get a slightly left of center uh, Kenneth Rogoff and put that person there? Wouldn't that be all right? Uh, this is in part because of some of the uh, the uh, blocking b uh, blocks to action that the the book points out, which include the culture of expertise inside the bank. Uh, the domination of that expertise. The, there's cause for reform, but it's really a problem right now. And uh, and actually, this goes to the question, though, that I, I want to, this is really a provocation, kind of in contrast to the point that Malcolm made, but just to say, well, where is the the care for the social agenda? Where's the duty of care for the whole economy? Isn't it possible that we can have a socially hostile government uh, in which, in, wherein we might want a central bank to protect the people. And uh, actually, would it be that we could turn the independence of central banks on its head uh, with to the idea that uh, if they have a degree of freedom, as the book in a sense argues, uh, couldn't this actually support the overall economy, even in the face of a, uh, a very ill-considered and short-sighted a set of policies by any government. Uh, it raises the question of, you know, what can they be? Now, th just to say that there was a conversation that I, I, um, I guess, curated uh, on March 20th uh, of the Rebuilding Macroeconomics, where um, Willem Belt Bowder, for example, said, well, the U.S. Congress can't fight its way out of a paper bag. But I want to give three, several examples here of, um, and on one page, of where uh, government has failed the people. The one would be the Community Development Financial Institutions Act, 
which was passed as a way of providing community-based financing for the, the people, especially the socially excluded people in the US. Minsky and the Levy Institute had a wonderful plan to make this very inclusive. The Clinton administration in implementing it through its US Treasury made a mockery of this and it, it ended up being a toy program with no impact. It was passed, by the way, after the 1992 Los Angeles uprising and was a, just a feeble gesture in that direction. And we've seen the result of that these days. Um, the second would be just to remind us that the Troubled Asset Relief Program passed in early 2009, again, given to the US Treasury to administer, uh, gave almost all of its money to the six too big to fail mega banks. Um, but then I wanna point out something even more evil which is that the you know I think that everybody knows perhaps the in the U.S. this is U.S. examples of course uh, the 1977 Community Reinvestment Act, which was uh, won by community struggle, and it calls on banks to serve their entire communities. There's language there. Um, now, once securitization started, and banks were apparently serving their communities by making more predatory loans and passing them on to this shadow uh, banking complex. Uh, then, uh, long story short, uh, the Congress passed in 1994 the Home Ownership Equity Protection Act, which put limits on predatory lending, including subprime lending. Federal Reserve Chairman uh, Greenspan, who right, was, was given this act to implement, uh, did not implement it. It was never implemented, even though it was on the books. It wasn't until uh, we had Bernanke come along in 2007, when we were right at the height of the subprime crisis, is when they actually promulgated rules and regulations. And today, uh, there's a guy called Joseph Odding, former head of One West, which was actually uh, the former Indy Bank that had been a subprime lender, bought by uh, uh, hedge fund uh, operator Steve Mnuchin, now the Treasury Secretary for, for Trump. Um, this was uh, basically, they were sued by the, the California Reinvestment Coalition for illegal foreclosures. Uh, this guy has been in office since December 2017, and he is at present promulgating rules to take the guts out of the CRA. Um, okay, second point. I really want to come back to you though, Kloma, on 100% reserve banking. Uh, I think it, it's, it could be financial dominance through a back door. Now, I have to say 100% reserve banking has been advocated by people like say positive money and normally it's talk about let's relocalize, let's go small. And really the vision is something like the German Sparkhausen that's close to the local business. And then they're part of a network of Landesbanken, which in turn can sell paper to the KFW, which makes it all good. And it's a nice thing. So there's a sort of turning to Europe. Uh, but I would remind us that actually what we've seen in Europe as the major initiative recently has been the Capital Markets Union, so-called Juncker plan. Of course, Juncker said this is gonna rain uh, investment on the EU. It never did, of course. Um, and instead, you know, uh, what it was aimed at doing was to incentivize countries to clean up their bankruptcy laws so that they can kick renters and, and uh, people who are foreclosed out of their places so they can nicely securitize all that paper in Europe. Um, so essentially more ground for the mega banks to take over. Well, just to say, um, it's a problem. Um, Market-based lending and 100% reserve banking, are they kind of the same? But then what does it mean to say bank-based lending these days? Do the banks serve the people? Who are the banks? Um, the mega banks are part of the financial dominance. The, the big ones in the U.S. have more than half of the U.S. assets. They you get what you pay for with that banking system. And I would just mention the leveraged loans as an example of a recent you know, disaster there. Okay, third point out of four, the fourth one's real quick, uh, just to make a point that sh needs to be made, which is that uh, underlying this thing is something kind of missing in your discussion. And I understand it wasn't about this, uh, but we just have to say that it was the Federal Reserve that kept the global financial system from collapsing especially uh, among other things with its, with its dollar swap lines in 2008, nine. 
And uh, basically developing countries were only marginally on board the G20 was created, there's a story there. Uh, but just to say that COVID-19 has accelerated the problems with the developing economies um, and the Federal Reserve is providing swap lines very selectively um, to uh, developing countries. Uh, there, and so not to all, so there's winners and losers that are being chosen and this has to do with US hegemony uh, with the exorbitant privilege of the US dollar is wrapped in that, even in this time of everyone despising the president of my home country. Um, and so this, the other thing to say is that the central banks and this central bank in particular has gotten deeper and deeper into backstopping the entire market-based system. Um, here's just a picture that shows you that global uh, developing country uh, debt's going up. But here's a list of the countries from the FT the other day of uh, the countries that don't have access to the Fed's dollar swap lines of credit. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, Argentina, kind of interesting choice there. Um, and Colombia, Chile, Turkey. Okay, so that just makes the point. Final page and final point. Just to say uh, that in this sense, do we need to kind of rethink it one step farther? Uh, the current system is generating one speculative asset class after another. Leveraged loans are just the most recent example. And like at one level, uh, you know, we there's a need for something different in the nation state. Uh, you can think of say uh, like community development banking and greenlining this kind of you know thing that Malcolm was raising, um, and and you know greening and greenlining, uh, socially excluded areas and sustainable loans. Um, but just to say that uh, the experience of the Brazilian National Bank, the BNDS. Uh, shows the fragility, the political fragility of these kinds of things. Uh, Mr. Guedes and the others there, Levy and others in Brazil are taking BNDS apart as what, uh, you know, to, for, for privatization, basically. So in the end, I, I'll leave you with one final problem. I, I'm just raising problems. You know, we got to finance the SDGs and we got to finance climate mitigation and adaptation, or not. According to UNCTAD, the bill is now $4 trillion, of which they've done about $100 billion. The current proposal by the G20 in fall 2018, uh, they're, they're talking about blended finance. What they mean is you fund this stuff, you de-risk it by having the risk picked up by multilateral development banks and sovereign nations. Uh, you repurpose the multilateral development banks as paper movers, basically, and underwriters. And they see that as a solution. The very people from OECD and ODI that went to Wall Street to talk about this couldn't get the attention of the, the Wall Street banks because basically these proposals were not, uh, so to speak, shovel ready for the securitization market. So why don't, don't we need to think ultimately of monetary financing and whatever you call it by a global central bank that backstops SDRs issued by national central banks aimed at these global problems. And Clement, I fully agree with your, pro your point about the speculation and the, the flight to tax havens. And we would have to have this global central bank uh, staffed by completely ethically and neut ethically neutral and judicially fair Martians incapable of, of corruption. But where else do we go? End of comments. Thank you for a wonderful read. Thank you very much, uh, Gary. <clears throat> you know, I'm listening to your comments, especially point number two or something. And I get the feeling that in Canada, we don't have the same problems with our banking system. Mario can uh, uh, comment on that, but I just don't think um, we have the same issues. And uh, I want to draw your pen attention to a forthcoming symposium in rope on public banking which has been alluded to a few times here i'm just waiting for gary to get rid of his slides i it, how do i and i'm and i'm sorry for this uh how do i do this maybe uh, i should you'll have to press alt s out alt x s s like s. A snake okay alt s not that didn't work. 
Uh, stop. Oh, here we go. Stop sharing. Thank you. That did it. Appreciate Thank that. You very much. All right. Indeed, we are back. So, uh, Clément, um, I'll give uh, you a chance to reply. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gary, for both your appreciation and your wonderful comments. So, I want to, to, to start by saying that you are absolutely right at pointing uh, the, the, the fact that the international dimension of the reflection is completely missing from the book. So, we were actually thinking that between ourselves and we had the dialogue with the editor as well. And, you know, we, <laughs> our constraints were very hard. We had to write less than 50,000 words. So yeah. at that rate, we were like, okay, we have to give this you up. Enough. Yeah. But you, 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 you're completely right. We cannot think that uh, in isolation, um, uh, actually the, the, the kind of dominance you find within monetary uh, systems are also found between monetary systems. Uh, just an example, it's just not the Fed playing out this experience privilege. If you actually look at what happened in Europe in 2008, when it was Central and Eastern European country, which needed both Euro and dollar, and the ECB cut uh, um, the vans of liquidity toward those countries uh, because they were not belonging to the same uh, monetary area. And, and interestingly, they actually even cut the, the dollar swap they were getting from the Fed, even though there were huge financing needs, they did not play the, the, the channel there because they were feeling not responsible for what was happening in Central and East Europe. So, so you're actually completely right that we have a, a big problem of, of, um, of uh, dollar dominance, but, uh, but this kind of phenomenon even happened on, on, uh, on smaller scales. And on this, I wanted to actually, so this is not my research, uh, but I wanted uh, to, to, to provide a reference. So uh, I always, I'm very bad at pronouncing her name, but uh, she's called Aditi Saraspude, and she wrote in the review of international political economy last year, drawing the lines, the politics of federal currency swaps in the global financial crisis. And for me, this she's one of the most wonderful scholars because she's she's applying the kind of diplomatic IR analysis on uh, Fed dollars, uh, and you can see how 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 well they are matching actually the U.S. diplomatic agenda, and and to a certain extent the Cold War <laughs> U.S. Uh, the diplomatic agenda. So it's true that a lot of things are playing out at this level. And, uh, and without a kind of Keynesian slash Triffin uh, solution of world monetary governance, uh, the politics of, uh, inequal of monetary inequality between global north and global south uh, will never disappear. So point completely yeah. taken, this should be part of the debate. Now, um, I just wanted to comment. So full reserve banking, I actually agree with you. Uh, you know, when you are free to write the book, you do internal compromises. I was never feeling super hot with full reserve banking. Yeah. But one of the co author really believe in that. But I, I think now his view has changed slightly. So, 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 so to me, the, the, the problem with full reserve banking is both uh, uh, if we put this kind of reglementation on what will they invent, there is also a problem with the transition phase when you pass from the actual regime to the food reserve yeah. banking, well, that would, that would uh, have a huge impact on, on the level of loans given to the real economy and so forth and so on. So, so, so there are too many issues and, and I, I feel that it's much better to try to separate uh, regular banking from uh, or community-based banking from investment banking and, and we should go towards more those so simple structural reforms uh, to, to, to separate the arms of, of this bank. Uh, to me, that it's much more promising than the, the, the full reserve banking proposal. Um, and lastly, okay, this was interesting because I, I, I really liked your governments are failing too, and sometimes we need central bank uh, to, 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 to correct them. And so this was also touching to the point I was trying to make between we need basic divisions of power and, and we, it's kind of cool that the Fed acts as a counter power when Trump wants to finance a war, basically. So, so, so I, I really share this kind of, of, of um, perspective, but now 
There is something that we don't know enough about, uh, which was the role that central banks played in the financialization of the economy. So very often, we, so, so deregulation um, policies are very, very often attributed exclusively to, to, to governments or ideas or whatsoever. And we forget the yeah. role central banks uh, play in that. And actually, beyond monetary policy, central bankers have been instrumental in two policies before the financial crisis. It was the financial regulation policy, on the one hand, and on the other hand, in Europe, it was about also uh, the um, uh, fiscal policies at large. And there, for example, people at the ECB, uh, since the start of the financial crisis, they have, uh, they have asked us conditionality for the monetary policy intervention, more rigor in the Eurozone financial regime. So basically all the, the series of reforms we had in the Eurozone to improve the fiscal rectitude, they were all pushed very, very, very hard by people uh, from the ECB. The same very people who say today that some governments in Europe do not spend enough, forgetting that they are binded by fiscal stra straitjacket that they actively contributed to implement. And the same is financial re-regulation. Re so the ECB and the Bank of England, they were actually the two central banks who were at the forefront to start the capital markets union. And even before the crisis, there were radical shifts in, in the risk evaluation of sovereign bonds in the Eurozone. So there was a decision that was made uh, by the ECB to create a unified repo uh, market. So this is the research done by Daniela Cabor, Kamel Ban. So, so this is already well researched, but basically the ECB pushed for more financial liberation on the repo market so that there would be more financial integration and convergence in the Eurozone. Well, we had uh, more flexible uh, collateral frameworks. We had baskets of Eurozone currency. We did not have further uh, economic integration because of course this kind of mechanism led to further economic imbalances. Uh, but, uh, but this is another topic. I just wanted to say that when we look closely at the kind of financial reforms implemented by governments, very often central bankers are not very far from that story. But then yeah. I know much less the US example, and uh, so, so I cannot comment on the, on the three examples you, you've given, but in the cases I know a bit more, which is uh, Bank of England and, um, and the European Union, in this case, central bankers were not really fighting uh, the policy proposals put for, forward by governments that we don't like. I think just two things. One is, um, uh, the, I think the, your point about the monopoly of expertise by central bank staff, uh, actually the fact that people in Europe mostly know about Europe, uh, people in the yeah. US mostly know about the US, people in Japan know about China, uh, Japan, and nobody knows about China. Uh, except mm -hmm. the, the speeches we get by the uh, central bank governors, people's bank governors. So that, that's part of that uh, monopoly. In the second point, I, I think your concept of financial dominance is really nice. And I would urge you and your co-authors to uh, go farther with it. Um, maybe, uh, I, th I think it, it fills a, a, a gap uh, because it's, you know, it's nothing personal. We're doing what we have to do. Um, and that and that point made again and again. I think there's something there that that isn't quite captured by other uh, terminologies. And again, it, it shows you know when they have to choose, what side are they on? Ben Bernanke is mm -hmm. just keeping all the business doors open, and that's the same rhetoric that uh, Jamie Dimon uh, says. And we know that Jamie Dimon is lying, and we know that Ben Bernanke is a nice guy. Uh, so you know we need something. <laughs> that that helps us to understand what the motives are and where the problems are. But again, thank you for a wonderful book. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Gary and Clement. I'm going to uh, open it up uh, to people uh, who may have questions. Uh, I'm going to go to Mario uh, to see if he has any questions or commentaries. Um, Mario. Uh I feel privileged here to have been invited to, to speak here, uh, to comment here. I, I really enjoyed, I mean, I appreciate what uh, Clement has done there. I'll have to read his book. I haven't seen it. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, I'm speaking, uh, you know, 
uh, out of the blue here in a sense, but I do appreciate it and I uh, would most certainly want to get a hold of it. Uh, I, I do want to uh, just make a couple of points here. Uh, one has to do with what Louis Philippe already said from the beginning. In all your presentation, nowhere did you actually talk about the impact of central banks on income distribution. It was primarily about, you know, wealth distribution, if you want to call it that. Okay? Mm -hmm. on the, you know, which central banks, by the way, talk about a great deal. Okay? But what they do not talk about is their role in impacting either directly or indirectly on income distribution. Mm -hmm. In fact, I could mention this quickly here. Last year, over a year ago, at the end of April 2019, we met with the, uh, uh, at the time, well, the, the deputy governor at the time of the Bank of Canada, uh, Carolyn Wilkins. And when we brought up this issue of why central banks should be concerned with income distribution, because we've been pushing, we've been lobbying the Bank of Canada to get rid of inflation, well, inflation targeting here is the only concern that they have, of course, and to introduce other goals, you know, like full employment, income distribution issues, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and uh, what she said, of course, was that we don't, we are not concerned. We don't do anything uh, on the income distribution front. We are neutral. And, you know, and, and, I, and I, I thought it was a big joke there almost, you know, because obviously, but it has a direct effect. And she did mention that, and it's ironic again. The only thing that she did mention was this thing about the wealth distribution effect. You know, the fact that obviously when you change interest rates, it's going to impact on debtors and, you know, and creditors, whatever you want to call it, differently. Uh, but other than that, uh, she did not concern herself with that, which is really the big issue, I would say. And uh, in fact, this goes through their whole bit, you know, on, on the way in which they, are, they conceive of the transmission mechanism of monetary policy, which has to do with the interest rate lever, okay? and not through the wealth effect direct, as directly. But it, indeed, there's also that, okay? And, and, but they never really talk about you know, the fact that over the last 50 years, if you were to classify that period, for the first, you know, from the 1980s, let's say 70s, 80s, literally, all the way to the financial, you know, the global financial crisis, we had essentially the, the revenge of the rentier, so to speak. And secondly, of course, since that time, we've seen almost the euthanasia of the rentier aspect, which has created a lot of problems as well, especially with pension funds, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So what I'm getting at here is that uh, that aspect, I didn't hear about it all from you. Okay? And uh, uh, there are a lot of other issues that I have, and I don't want to even, uh, I'm not sure if I, uh, what time we have here, but I just say one important thing here, please distinguish, I mean, I don't, I'm, I think Louis Philippe and I would, were very much on the same wavelength on this as well, which is that the 100% uh, reserve banking, I'm no fan of that. I think it's the wrong way to go. And for some of the reasons that Malcolm, actually what Malcolm said, it was Hayek in 1938 who said the same thing, by the way. I'm being facetious here, but it's something that is not, a, you know, it's really, you know, the idea that they'll just go around, the, you know, they circumvent this anyways. But the issue here is more than that, which is that what we want is basically a commitment to the community. Public banking versus 100%, you know, or narrow banking, or whatever you want to call it, I think that's what we should go more towards. And, and that's something which I think, again, was missing in, in this whole issue here. Uh, one last thing, if I'm allowed to mention, has to do with the capacity of central banks to do anything, really, you know. They can uh, impact directly on certain things, which is the interest rate primarily, as we've been saying, okay. But, uh, and therefore through that income distribution as well, you know, but in terms of other effects, you know, whether it be in terms of achieving certain high levels of employment, et cetera, et cetera, we may ask too much of central banks to do that. For sure, I agree completely. However, what is important is to condition government discourse. 
And that is to say that what we've seen over the last while is not only is there been so-called central bank independence in varying degrees, you know, in terms of this institutional structures that they set up, as for example, in the Eurozone. But what we've seen is that their so-called ideological independence has been imposed on governments themselves to some extent, because they've been swallowed up by this sort of, you know, the worst forms that we've seen of ideological, you know, manipulation here, I would call it, in the way we framed all kinds of stuff, you know, in economics, and especially on monetary policy. And this has gone to the point where France is like, in our case, again, where we're trying to lobby central banks here in Canada, okay, full employment, when our Minister of Finance met with us, he thought it was a kind of pipe dream, you know, I think he called it literally, okay, to have, to achieve full employment. Now, we could debate as to what it could be, but to mention that as if somehow it's just an illusion or something that we cannot ever co concern ourselves about, despite the fact that over 50 years before that, there have been many governors who actually talked about that, uh, you know, central banks, that has to be changed. And the fact that we could include that in a mandate, that there should be concern about income distribution, there should be concern about full employment, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, what it does, it, it allows a discourse within government at large, which includes a central bank in this, okay? Despite the various forms of independence, quote unquote, and the extreme one being the Euros, uh, you know, the, the European Central Bank here, all of these condition and affect and the way in which then ultimately policies are framed and discussed and, and achieved as well. And that's something, again, that is important to be, you know, really, address. Anyways, I, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to go off on other things here, but those were issues that cropped up in my mind. Thank you, Mario. Clément? Yeah, thank you very much, Mario. Um, so, uh, you, you, your first point is well taken, and it was also uh, the point of, uh, of Louis-Philippe. So, it's true that we, again, size, uh, space constraint, we, we we thought that the debate on the distributive effect of conventional monetary policy was more covered already, well, by the works of Louis Philippe, or I think also about Gerald Epstein and, and, and others, but uh, that we knew a bit less about unconventional monetary policy. But it's true also that we did an intellectual mistake by ruling out the, the traditional debate. And, and that's what you say, Louis Philippe, that we forgot to, 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 to plug back in the effect of unconventional monetary policy on the very classic uh, interest rate. And now, um, on, on that debate, again, there, there is a much better literature than what we could do, but what I, what I like when I think about that is to think about the effect of, of uh, the central bank monetary regime on inflation, um, on inflation control. Uh, at large. So, so, for example, in Europe, what was very interesting is the way the ECB was pushing for the build-up of a re regime of stability. Not only monetary policy, but also fiscal policy, also the importance of trade unions, the importance of, of uh, structural reforms on the labor markets, and so forth and so on. So they were pushing very, very, very hard for that, and, and, and um, the fact that, that they could fixate the monetary policy and that it was a given and that Governments had to adapt to that. Um, so that's also how I like to think about the distributive effect of central banking regime. So not only looking at the, at the monetary policy, but also at how central bank influence other policies. And, and maybe it's through this way that we could recapture a bit more uh, the, the, the influence not only on wealth inequality, but also on income inequalities. But for example, for me, I think income inequalities in Europe were mostly driven by the, the, the collapse of trade union and, and let's say the shifting um, uh, power balance between uh, trade unions and, employ and uh, employers at large. And on this, central banks did play a role. So we had good social science study on, on, the, on the effect of, of uh, orthodox uh, monetary policy on trade unionization and so forth and so on. So, so I think I, I would also take this angle to, to, to capture uh, the, the, this kind uh, of effect. And I just wanted to say a second thing. Uh, so yeah, 
I was not clear on that, but the way we want to think about the reform of the financial system go exactly in your way. So again, full rebanking, let's take that off. But when I was trying to, 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 to push for structural reform uh, in the banking sector, I was thinking about very traditional tools such as some kind of modern glass steel gas act and so forth and so on. So to, to go more towards forms of narrow community banking rather than kind of financial financialized investment banks that we have today. Thank you, Kim. Um, I just want to make a comment. My reading about my reading of the mainstream literature on income distribution and central banking is that uh, people like Benoit Curie, for example, and others, they argue yet yeah, that there are distributive variables, whether they are from conventional or unconventional policies, but these are temporary or side effects and the inevitable result of pursuing sound monetary policy. And because they are negligible or short uh, term, they can be put aside in the pursuit of monetary policy. And I think this is, um, you know, at first when I was reading these, this literature, I was very happy about it, but the conclusions are very different than what heterodox uh, authors would argue that they are large or they are more permanent or they are um, anyways, especially if you take into consideration the, uh, the income, uh, the income effect side. Okay. If anyone else, we probably have a time for one more question. If anyone else has a, a question or a comment, please unmute yourself and uh, draw attention. Okay, so uh, yes, I had a question oh, that I spent by writing uh, to, to Malcolm, but I would also like to say that this discussion has made me think very much about whether a, a state, a capitalist state, can have multiple levels of independence. Uh, I've I've been looking at in Canada, for example, the different roles of different departments and their prominence in the Canadian federal government. And what you find, for example, is that in certain periods, certain departments have more resources and are allowed more, quote unquote, autonomy or independence. And what we, originally agriculture was huge. Uh, later, labor took on a big role and in international policy. And now finance seems to be predominant. And I think that reflects the structural changes within capitalism itself and, and the growth of concentration. Um, but I think, um, you know, uh, Malcolm and Gary and Clement have, have raised some interesting questions. Can you have a state with multiple centers of power? And uh, I, I think that finance, for me, the independence of it has been independence from democracy. But you, you, uh, you know, you could conceive of a more after a governmental shift in a more progressive policy, why there might be a need for having certain autonomous debates within a state to preserve overall norms of distribution once the redistribution has occurred. And I, I can't, uh, you know, I can't say for sure if there's an answer to this, I think this will be an ongoing struggle. But I did have that question uh, for Malcolm about the roles of trade unions in the Bank of England, because I thought that was a fascinating point that I had not heard of before. And maybe there's some experience in Europe about that. There's never been a single labor representative on the Bank of Canada. It's totally captured by the financial sector. Okay. Uh, Mario, uh, let's go to Mario first, because he's shaking his and oh, there was one <laughs> in 1937 or something. <laughs> Mario, you have to uh, unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. Okay, actually, David, there was. <laughs> and really? In 1937, actually, in the 1980s, I met the guy. So I can tell you. Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm sorry, but he was a trade union rep for the Canadian Labor Congress. I can't remember all the details. Okay, well, that's good to know. What's I had wrong I about that. Him. <laughs> Okay, so we'll give the last comment to uh, Clément. Yeah, just... And let me say a word too. Okay. Gary, do you want to... No, I, I... 
Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be quick, actually, uh, because uh, David, it's good to hear you. Um, actually, I think you, it, it's worth looking at the United States, where California, for example, has always prided itself on running kind of its own economy. Um, you know, I lived there for many years, as you know, I was involved with the policy there. And, and yet, if you look at what they have done, if we did a history, it would look a lot like the measures being undertaken by European na nation states now. In, in you know in the light of the restrictions on what they can do so that's it's it's worth looking at that and the other comment i would make is that in that very incendiary 20th of march uh, webinar that we held with two experts it was papadia and uh, uh was uh, uh uh martin helwig uh were the two european kind of you know grand thinkers from ecb they both call for major changes but they they understood that they were speaking in the context of preserving the European Union. They uh, didn't want to go past that. So in some sense, I think, David, perhaps you're raising a question that really deserves a lot more study. How can we work with multi-level governments without ripping them apart um, as, as is, you know, would be another solution? So thank, thank you. Thank you. So I, I just wanted to make the point to David, the, the model for the UK and for the Bank of England, it was somebody sat on the, I think it was on the court of the Bank of England, but in one sense from the trade unions. And it was um, parallel with quite a lot of the, of the nationalised industries that the board of directors of a nationalised industry would have one or two representatives of the national trade union movements. It was also caused in the context of the, the type of monetary policies which were being operated, which were things like credit allocation, um, selected credit allocation those sort of policies which were also being pursued and that and those policies were very much uh, i suppose they implemented or not they were implemented by the bank of england but they would be decided upon by the by the treasury basically mm, thank you thank you okay came up yeah a very sh uh, a short last word so thanks for all these fascinating remarks and i really like the, the, the fact that the discussion was very centered about institutionalist political economy argument that that, that really freshen up uh, uh, how we think and, and from that perspective i really like the concept of institutional arrangements and i think that this is how we should evaluate the the degree of autonomy given to central banks uh, it's in relation with their institutional environment for example i think that both the Bundesbank and the european central bank are very independent central bank but for many reasons the independency from the Bundesbank was much less problematic in democratic terms. Why? Because the Bundesbank was dealing with very strong trade unions. And this is how you had a, some kind of balance yeah. of power yeah. here with a very strong independent central bank, but very strong labor unions as well. And it was not a completely at par negotiation, but it was challenging negotiation for both sides at the same time. And the problem of the European construction was that we took that monetary mm -hmm. template of the Bundesbank without the trade union part. Mm -hmm. And so it's quite interesting to think about it yeah. that way because here you have exactly the same template, the same, the, the, not similar, but, but, but similar uh, yeah. degrees of autonomy, but it takes a complete different form and has the very different consequences according to the, 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 the strength of other macroeconomic partners, including trade union. And so th th that's why I think, uh, and maybe that's my concluding line, I think we, should, we, we cannot think about central bank uh, institutional design in isolation with other relevant uh, macroeconomic institutions. Thank, thank you. you very, thank you very much. Um, you know, Clément, if you feel uh, that you want to write an article following the discussion today, please send it to my journal. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a pleasure, Louis Philippe. <laughs> when I have time to write articles, I will do that. <laughs> I'll give you a week. Uh, <laughs> okay. That's the you... editor speaking. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, well, um, I want to thank everyone. This has been just a, a great webinar. I enjoyed it. Came, uh, the inspiration came from, of course, I knew of the book, but we published, uh, or it's coming out now, a review of your book. And it's uh, in, yeah, yeah, in re I'll send it to you. And it, it's, it's going to come out uh, soon. And uh, 
So I started to think that this might be actually a good, and it's a good review. And I thought it would be a good, uh, a good webinar. And, and, and I was correct. It was a fantastic webinar. Thank you, Clément Fontan. Thank you, Guillaume Vallet, Malcolm Sawyer, Gary Dimsky, Marie as always, and David Ledbeater. Nice to see you on here again. And uh, until the next webinar, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. A great pleasure. Have a great day. Thanks. Thank Bye. you all. Bye-bye.